given the fact that MIVID 2 is European legislation, what are the effects that it will have on Asian banks? Uh, the fact that it's European legislation doesn't mean there isn't an impact on Asian clients as far as MIFID 2 is concerned. Areas in terms of the data transparency issues which Asian clients will need to be aware of, transaction reporting, particularly if they're going through a European booking entity or a European venue, are areas they may need to be concerned with, as well as some of the extraterritorial impact that MIFID has around trading on a trading venue and the trading obligation as well as uh, ETD clearing, indirect clearing. So there are a number of areas that, from a MIFID II standpoint, that has an extraterritorial impact, not just purely on European organizations and European-centric organization. Anyone that's got a European client, anyone that's interacting in Europe market, in European markets, trading on European venues, dealing in European securities, is going to have impact, uh, or MIFID II is going to have an impact on them. Right. And how are you seeing Asian regulators responding to MIFID II? Well, that's an interesting area. We, we've had a, I've spent a lot of time traveling throughout Asia on this particular trip covering Singapore, Beijing, and now Hong Kong. And on the whole, most regulators are looking to understand whether they will implement something comparative to MIFID II. Bear in mind MIFID II is the European response to the G20 initiative on OTC transactions and transparency into OTC markets. So a number of regulators are looking at whether they should be implementing something similar. And also in the back of their mind, they've got the concept of equivalence, where in order for organizations to be accepted into Europe, creating a branch structure and so on, the European Commission needs to grant equivalence to those entities regulator, their home regulator. And therefore the regulators are often worried about or often looking at whether they need to do something similar to MIFID II in their own OTC markets. Now equivalence is a big issue. Uh, another one that often gets misunderstood are third party firms. Can you tell us a little bit more what that means? Un understandably, there's a lot of confusion I think around equivalence and third party or third country firms. So a third country firm is, if this were an organization offering investment services and investment advice and it were based in Europe, it would be deemed an investment firm as far as ESMA are concerned. So it's still offering the same investment services, it's still offering the same invest investment advice, but it's head office, it's headquarters outside of Europe. And therefore, from a European perspective, it would be deemed a third country firm. And then there are rules around how that third country firm can establish itself within a particular region. Does it have to create a branch? Does it have to create a legal entity within Europe in order to be able to access those European markets? So the third country firm definition and equivalence as a whole is an interesting area. If equivalence isn't granted, and that's a question I get asked a lot, um, or if organizations, countries, jurisdictions, let's say, are waiting on equivalence, what happens? Does it mean you can't access the European markets and so on? Well, there you fall under the auspices of the local regulator, the local law. So if, for example, your branch is in the UK, then you would fall under the auspices of the UK. If it were in Germany, you would fall under the auspices of German law. So it's considered probably a two-year process to get equivalence. Um, the European Commission has gone out and talked about phases of equivalence in terms of certain markets and certain jurisdictions. And I think probably in the intervening months uh, between when equivalence is granted for certain markets and when it's achieved for others, then they'll fall under the auspices of the local law. But you know, we're waiting on the regulators perhaps to confirm that. Now one final question for you. With uh, just a few months left until the implementation of MIFID II, what can Thomson Reuters clients do to prepare for it? Well, they, they certainly need to start, and you're right to point out the urgency. I think it's something like 147 business days or something like that until the 3rd of January. So the urgency around MIFID is tantamount. There's no, no, no room for complacency whatsoever. So I think Thomson Reuters clients should be looking at their own use cases, look at um, how they, particularly in Asia, particularly how the, the transaction flows uh, manifest themselves in their organization. Is it an Asian client coming to an organization here in Hong Kong, let's say, that books an entry through a London booking entity? What does that mean in terms of what those MIFID touch points are? And therefore understand at a very pragmatic level what the implications are of MIFID, uh, what the implications of MIFID are on those organizations. It's very easy to sort of theorize about MIFID 2 and very quickly you find yourself in some sort of circular argument 
convincing yourself 180 degrees to what you just convinced yourself was the right answer. But if you look at it in terms of pragmatic use cases and, and transaction flows, understand what the touch points are for MIFID. I think that will help identify where you need to operationalize. Do you need to understand determining whether something has been trading on a trading venue? Um, do you need to apply conduct of business rules from a client onboarding perspective? Do you need to even define clients in terms of professional, eligible professional retail, and eligible counterparty, sorry, and retail? All of those things may need to be done, but I think the, the transaction flow, the workflow, if you like, will help you identify that. Then come and talk to us. It's as simple as that, um, and we'll try and help where we can. John, thank you very much for giving us your time today. My pleasure, Will. Thanks very much.